Swamp Pindar, and, and I like to paint, and, and I like to write software. So about 10 years ago, I, I built a painting robot. Um, and it was a robot that I built to paint like I did with a brush on canvas. I've built four more robots since, each of them um, with more sophisticated artificial intelligence, each of them trying to paint more like I painted. We can paint in a lot of different styles, though recently we've been concentrating on portraits, uh, like this one here of my, of my children. So these robots, they, uh, they surpassed my technical ability a long time ago. And creatively, they're catching up. To give you guys uh, an idea of just how creative they have become and what I even mean by creativity, I'm going to first tell you about a bunch of the algorithms they use. And then I'm going to go ahead and uh, tell you in detail about one algorithm or one process called a feedback loop. Then after that, I'm going to walk you through the creation of a couple paintings. I'm going to let you all decide for yourself uh, just what you think is going on here. Decide for yourself if you think these, are, these machines are actually creative. Um, but this is all easier to show than explain. So let's look at some of these uh, portraits. And, and this is the very first portrait of my son. And what I did is I, I would feed the computer uh, dots, and it would just connect them. It was connecting the dots, not that creative at all. Over the next several years, however, I started uh, experimenting with various artificial intelligence algorithms. And, and trying each of them, I tried to make the robots more independent. And these, these algorithms included algorithms to you know, make their own dots to connect, sometimes simple, like in this one, a repeat of that other portrait, sometimes more complex. I had processes that would balance compositions, I had others that would uh, create unique compositions, um, and I had others that would try and paint stylistically. Um, and my favorite one of all was called K-Means Clustering, which I'm using here and the creation of a portrait of my daughter. And, and I use that to create color palettes and, and find ways to paint those color palettes. So about two years ago, um, I opened up control of the robot to the internet and to anyone uh, to paint with it. Uh, all you needed to do was um, go to a, a website and trace over an image. And then the robot would immediately take your strokes and trace uh, what you were tracing. And, and this led to a lot, of, uh, a lot of people had a lot of fun with this and led to a lot of crowdsourced art. And to my current experimentation, where I try and watch how people are using the robot and take direction from them and actually learn from them. So um, here, this is actually an interesting uh, portrait that had a little of everything. It had a lot of the robot's algorithms. Hundreds of people from around the world were painting with it. And um, it also had... At the end, I, I gave my kids, I really love this, I gave my kids the opportunity to do the final strokes, and they seized that opportunity and played tic-tac-toe on Lincoln's face. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you can see it right there, the eyes, <laughs> the O's right on his eyes. So the, um, the one algorithm I wanted to tell you about in detail, the process is called a feedback loop, and it sounds like something you would hear about in uh, computer science class, but I actually learned about it in art school when I was reading about painter Paul Clay's take on creativity. And for him, um, every painting had a beginning and an end. And in between, there was a lot of uh, the painter or the artist would switch back and forth between making a mark and taking a step back to evaluate, then making another mark and taking another step back to evaluate over and over again in this feedback loop. And that really made a lot of sense to me because that's how I painted my portraits. And I decided I wanted my robots to paint the same way. But there was a problem, of course, and, and that is that my robots were blind. They couldn't see what they were doing. So way back uh, between my second and third robot, I added a camera. And I pointed that camera at the, uh, at the canvas. So now every robot since has been able to watch what it was painting. And, and you can see, I'm going to show you this time lapse here. You can see how the robot watches what it's painting and makes adjustments compared to what it's, do or compared to what it's doing uh, in this time lapse. So let's rewind to the beginning, and you'll see all the brushes are getting taken off. And I'm going to play it forward in a second, but you can see here what we started with, just a blank canvas and a photograph. And then here I'm going to put this little visual aid for you. The, and this visual aid, this heat map in the middle, is it just shows how the robot has calculated the differences between the canvas and the, uh, and the photo. The, uh, the, the brighter the color, the greater the difference. And so I'm about, when I hit play on this, on this uh, time lapse, what you're going to see is you're going to see the robot seek out the areas with the greatest difference, look down at the bottom, find the color that will make the canvas most like the painting, and paint that brush stroke. Then it's going to take another picture to recalculate. So watch as the painting progresses and the, uh, the differences fade away. So 
A lot of people want to see that again. I'm going to show you another one of these so you can see something like that happen again. And, uh, and, and the reason I want to move on is because this, is, this painting has a lot more than just feedback loops going on in it of algorithms that were, uh, I've, you could see I did a lot of brush strokes with my own finger. And that's how I typically like uh, to make paintings with my robots. I like to collaborate with them. And, um, but it doesn't always have to be like that. Uh, this next painting, which I made with my, uh, my son, was done completely by the robot. In fact, my son and I, we don't know if we like to say or we even can say we made it because few, if any, creative decisions were made by us. The only decision we made was to uh, sit down for a bunch of photos. From there, the robot picked its favorite, created a unique composition, and painted. And it did this by first uh, using the Viola Jones face detection algorithm to find his face in each uh, photo. And if it couldn't find a face, it would, it would toss and disregard, and you can see the green square around his face. It then used hard cascades to find his eyes and mouth. And then it actually used an algorithm that we wrote to look at the eyes and mouth, measure the symmetry, the proportion, and uh, calculate the direction he was looking in to pick a favorite, and then to crop the uh, image uh, into an original composition. Now, from this original composition, I used k-means clustering, that algorithm I told you about earlier, first to create an underpainting, and then to create something for the more nuanced tones. And from there, the robot painted, but not blindly. The robot used its camera and feedback loops to try and remove the differences between the canvas and the original composition that it had come up with. And something even more interesting, it used feedback loops to decide when to stop. What happened was, as soon as it realized its strokes were not making the painting anymore, like the uh, photo that I was trying to paint, it just decided it had done its best and it was over. So when you think about this, when this robot started, it didn't know what it was going to paint. Um, with each brushstroke, it didn't know what the next brushstroke was going to be until it considered all the previous brushstrokes and the effect it had on the painting. And then in, it didn't even know when it was going to stop until eventually it, it looked at, after one brushstroke, it looked at the painting and thought to itself, wow, this is the best I can do. And it was over. So the reason I find this very interesting is because this is very similar to how I paint uh, portraits. It's, um, and, and I know I told you all earlier, I was going to let you all decide. And of course, you're, everyone's free to decide whether they or not they think machines can be creative. But I have no choice but to accept it now. Because if I don't ex uh, accept that these machines are creative, then it calls into question whether or not when I paint my portraits, whether or not I'm being creative. So it's actually kind of sweet when you compare the very first portrait to our most recent. For it's, uh, it is a coincidence, but it is true that both of them are my, of them, my second son and shows just how far we've come from the, uh, when we first started connecting the dots to painting portraits completely on our own. And I've gotten them this far by taking my own creative process and uh, breaking it down into pieces small enough that I was able to teach it to a machine. And this is, this is all about teaching. Teaching the most naive student imaginable how to do something that comes easy to us. Trying to teach it how to be creative and as we continue to work, and as we continue to experiment with new uh, artificial intelligence algorithm, I'm looking forward to the day that their creativity surpasses mine. And with even greater anticipation, I'm looking forward to the day that uh, they do something that I wasn't expecting and, and something that really surprises me, perhaps even by uh, doing something they weren't taught. Thank you very much.